Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to uh, welcome you to today's event in honor of His Excellency Tariq El Mulla, Minister of Petroleum. Um, today, agenda, after the welcoming remarks done by Chairman Khalid Nasir, the minister is going to give a PowerPoint presentation, and then we're going to have a Q&A session moderated by Mohamed Fouad. And then we'll serve uh, dinner. Uh, I would also like to share with you uh, Biba's forthcoming events. On Monday, we're having a bre breakfast briefing uh, with Her Excellency Dr. Rania Mashat. And then we're going to have, uh, in June, our yearly business mission to the UK. It's going to be held from the 13th to the 16th of June. And the main topic is going to be decarbonization. So if you'd like to join our event, please contact Inji and Nagar and we look forward for you to join our mission. Uh, I would like to ask Khalid Nasir to give the welcoming remarks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all today and to welcome His Excellency Engineer Talak El Mullah, Minister of Petroleum and Mineral uh, Resources. Uh, His Excellency has been a big supporter of uh, Biba and uh, has always uh, been with us every year. So it's a yearly tradition that we would like to continue, inshallah. And uh, we also hope to have him with us in uh, our uh, business mission, uh, as he's done uh, before. Uh, His Excellency, of course, has worked in different fields in various positions in engineering, operations, planning, sales and marketing at uh, Chevron Egypt. And then, uh, of course, he joined the EGPC uh, as the CEO uh, before becoming uh, Minister of uh, Petroleum. He's, uh, of course, uh, known with all his accomplishments in the uh, sector and the advancement that happened in the sector. And, uh, of course, uh, lately, he spearheaded the, the, the whole decarbonization um, efforts and, 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 and uh, initiative uh, that was launched uh, along with uh, COP27. Um, so we welcome His Excellency. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our uh, platinum sponsors, BP, Capricorn, Egypt, Egyptian Propylene and uh, Polypropylene, and our gold sponsor, Taka Arab Arabia, Silver sponsor Neptune Energy, and our event partners Banque du Caire, Glaxo Smith Klein, Swiss Canal Bank, Tatwir Masr, and Vodafone. Uh, without uh, further ado, I would uh, give the floor to His Excellency for his keynote address. Your Excellency, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Engineer Khaled Nusir. So, uh, dear guests, dear BIBA members, um, really it is indeed a pleasure to be with you after uh, after a few months now of important events that we uh, experienced and were uh, of good highlights for Egypt, especially when we talk about the energy sector, oil and gas. So, uh, thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for, uh, for listening to me. And actually, today, what we agreed on is to talk about the decarbonization. Uh, so, perhaps, uh, those uh, guests who are expecting me to talk about uh, upstream exploration, discoveries, uh, perhaps tonight we'll not cover this, but we'll talk about an important topic, which is the decarbonization, as an event of coming out of the COP27. And when I said that uh, this event tonight is important after three major events, and I, went, I, I, I meant really the first was the COP27, successful COP27 that uh, Egypt hosted in Sharm el-Sheikh, and uh, the world has recognized an important thing, which is the uh, decarbonization uh, thematic day that uh, we held and uh, with uh, a successful breakthrough 
to have oil and gas uh, joining COPs and to have a good seat on the table in order to be listened. The other event was our uh, important uh, Egypt uh, petroleum show or Egypt, uh, which was held last month. And I think that uh, most of you were there, whether uh, as participants or sponsors or exhibitors or speakers. So I think that uh, this was an event, uh, especially this year after uh, its sixth edition, was a, uh, indeed a great success. And I'm not talking because I am the, uh, I would say, the, uh, the founder of this uh, Egypt's uh, show. But actually, this is the feedback that we all received. So uh, it was very uh, good to hear from people and uh, third parties and the world that Egypt show this year uh, has really been to the level of uh, important, I wouldn't say the, but among uh, the important events and conferences globally. And this wouldn't have happened without your support as well, as partners, as sponsors, uh, feeling the, uh, the United uh, the United Industry, as I always say, we are all together looking after one industry, which is our oil and gas industry. Third event, actually, and as you know, I just arrived from the USA during the Sarah Week, uh, important uh, uh, conference in energy, where also we had, as Egypt, very good uh, engagements and uh, very high recognition by the international uh, corporations as well as international uh, industry. And I think that uh, over the last few years, uh, we've been able to successfully put Egypt on the global energy map. So uh, again, I have to thank you as uh, business community and partners who have helped us uh, to achieve this position. So tonight we'll be talking about a more specific uh, topic, which is the decarbonization, uh, in light of what happened during COP27, and taking over now uh, for the coming few years, how we will work closely uh, in the global effort to uh, combat uh, global warming. So these are the outlines of my few slides, and I will try to make it quickly because I would like to avail more time for Q&As and perhaps the interview with uh, Mohammed Fouad. So our sustainable energy strategy that we have uh, jointly uh, prepared with Ministry of Electricity in 2016, and in alignment with uh, Egypt's vision 2030, Actually, the most important uh, bullet that was not written, which should be here, was saying that in 2016, we had an energy mix of 42% for renewable by the year 2035. But in the, during that date, definitely, we had included, by the way, some uh, coal and some um, um, re, um, nuclear. As you see, time evolves and technology advances. And uh, with the challenges that uh, happened over the last few years, especially after the war, Russian-Ukrainian war, I think that we've seen yourself uh, the conversations and the discussions uh, in accelerating uh, new energies. And therefore, we also, in alignment with that, we have uh, started to update our energy strategy 
which should be announced within the coming uh, few weeks um, to read the latest advances and the latest technologies which includes now hydrogen. In 2016, nobody was talking about hydrogen at all, and I'm saying hydrogen only because I did not say any color uh, yet. So uh, the, word, the word hydrogen itself was not mentioned at all. So we needed to include two things, new types of fuels, new types of energies, among which was uh, now is the hydrogen, whether blue, green, gray, whatever. And we needed also to recognize that technology is advancing and therefore the date of 2035 will get closer. So we will address the date 2035 to read 2030 when we talk about 42% of renewables. So these are the things that uh, uh, will be included and was needed to update our strategy. And uh, in order to have an energy mix, a balanced energy mix, and meanwhile, uh, an accelerated one, and also would reflect the needs of having the uh, the natural gas as a main uh, element of uh, fossil fuel, no other kind of fuels to be included in the uh, pie of our energy mix. So when we talk about our strategy, uh, we used to have this slide a few years back when we, do, when we had our modernization uh, strategy project implemented, we were addressing three main pillars, the energy security, and of course you know what meant and what does it mean now even. At that time we were talking about uh, cutoffs of electricity, queues in service stations, shortages in uh, gas supplies, half of the factories were off, as you remember. So this was the time when we were talking about energy security, production was not sufficient. Therefore, the red bullet there is talking about the decarbonization activities and these are the new elements that are added into the strategy when we update it. So when you talk about the strategy, it needs to be evergreen, it has to be always uh, updated the, f the second pillar is the financial sustainability. And here, in this regard, we talk about monetizing the decarbonization. So we need to make some good opportunity and good business out of the decarbonization. So therefore, with this decarbonization, and those who attended with us the decarbonization day during COP27, it was plenty of companies, plenty, plenty of uh, uh, investors, financial institutes, taking advantage of all being together in order to either uh, submit or apply or offer their uh, services and their technologies for decarbonization uh, or offering also uh, funds for decarbonization opportunities. So this is an important business activity that we will be seeing it growing day after day. The sector governance, and here we are talking about a unified sector focus on decarbonization. So we need to all be aligned. So we are not talking about international companies or uh, regional companies to take over for the decarbonization responsibility alone. No, it includes the state-owned companies, the joint ventures, public sector. I mean, the entire industry, upstream, downstream, and midstream, together with all kind of players and uh, partners. So this needs to be aligned and has to go from top bottom, and this will come from the ministry and EGPC, EGAS, in order to make sure 
that we cascaded down. When we talk about our COP27 and how proudly we were able to successfully introduce the Decarbonization Day as the first time ever to have to recognize this industry during COPs. So therefore, under a thematic day called decarbonization, we were able to organize with very important uh, partners and consultants to organize a good prepared day, uh, both with SNP and BCG, where we were able to put a proper agenda, proper audience, proper speakers, proper uh, panelists, and we were able to showcase different uh, examples and different best practices globally. So we had successfully, during our COP, as you know, more than 100 head of state and we received more than 50,000 participants during COP and was among the highest visitors during any of uh, previous COPs. The outcome also was very important in addition to our decarbonization that the loss and damage fund, so this was also recognized. So the deep privileged countries and people that were requested to bear this, uh, I think that the outcome and the negotiators, and here we have to, to acknowledge also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs being the uh, president of the COP, together with its negotiating team, where each ministry is participating, but uh, led by Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I think this was a successful outcome, as well as what we were able to have, like the Sharm el-Sheikh implementation plan, uh, in order to uh, drive climate action in line with Paris agreements. I think that uh, most of the outcomes, especially when we talk about Africa, and we were representing Africa as well, an important initiative also was launched and presented uh, during COP27. So, we had uh, His Excellency John Kerry opening with us the day together with uh, His Excellency Jared Muller, UNIDO Director General, and this was the opening session on that day, and this was a good kickoff and I think that uh, very good eight sessions were held uh, where we showed cases uh, where different companies and technology providers and operators uh, were able to really prove their commitments and to show to the world that the oil and gas sector could really uh, be part of the solution and they hereby uh, we can accelerate uh, the decarbonization, not only uh, with our oil and gas industry, but also with other industries that were invited on that day. Uh, the other hard to abate industries like steel and fertilizers together with cement. Our key announcements on that day, when we spoke about the energy efficiency strategy, and this was uh, cleared and announced at the end of the day. The energy efficiency strategy 2235, as well as the Shalm Sheikh oil and gas methane reduction roadmap. And we have now prepared the roadmap whereby uh, could be adapted and adopted by any other country for uh, its country specific implementation, uh, which is a good outcome when we talk about uh, quick win uh, methane reduction. The East Mediterranean Gas Forum, the EMGF, also had its decarbonization. And this year, we are holding the presidency as well. So it is important to be proud to say that 
Egypt has taken lead not only in creating the uh, organization, but also taking the lead in uh, initiating several initiatives that will be covering the uh, member countries as well as the East Mediterranean in general. Also, we announced the low carbon hydrogen strategic framework because we are yet to announce the strategy itself, but we are still concluding within the coming few weeks the uh, final uh, outcome of the uh, low carbon hydrogen and we mean here together with our partners, which is the EU, um, who is helping us together with Ministry of Electricity to have this strategy. We mean by saying low carbon because, as I said earlier, that it will include blue carbon, uh, blue hydrogen, it will include uh, gray or brown or uh, green because it depends on the pricing and where the break-even point comes between whether it is economic at any certain point to sell it at any of the colors of the hydrogen versus other kinds of fuels or energy. We had different participations of different leaders, different ministers, and different uh, uh, global CEOs, and these are few pictures of different organizations and uh, head of uh, companies uh, who participated during the either the, de the decarbonization day or the energy day or at any of the uh, uh, events during the, the period of the COP27. So when we talk about the key pillars of the decarbonization activities, we have six pillars, and we will go through them in details. But in general, how we would reach the goal of decarbonization activities if we do not reform our subsidy, if we do not uh, uh, talk about natural gas uh, to complement any other renewable, if we talk about energy efficiency, renewables, and bioenergy, hydrogen. All this together are the uh, pillars of our decarbonization activities. And when I talk, for example, how we uh, cover the, the subsidy reform and how it's helping to decarbonization. So this is coming by first we need to reform our energy, and that's why when we started to introduce the automatic fuel indexation, which where we review the fuel prices every quarter, because we need to go away from subsidies. More subsidies means more consumption, means cheaper uh, treatment of uh, products, means more emissions, more more pollution. So if you put the right price for the right fuel, it reflects on the consumption. Then you, in, you reduce the uh, emissions. Meanwhile, proje, uh, pro, program li programs like Takafalu Karama and other kind of social safety nets were uh, introduced. We also uh, started to improve the uh, pricing mechanism between different types of products. So we were able to adjust and correct the formulas between different type of fuels in order not to have consumers migrating from a fuel to another uh, depending on which is, more, which is more subsidized. So uh, if we put the, uh, the proper pricing to each million BTU by any kind of product, you will not find uh, this kind of uh, transit from a type to another. When we talk about the, uh, how we add the natural gas into our energy mix in order to prove the quality of air, because as we know, natural gas 
is the least, the least of the fossil fuel having emissions, less carbon. So when we, when we see in the year 2000, we were having like a consumption of 37 million tons per year, which is the number in red. Then the, the, the green part of the bar is the gas, while the blue is the other f petroleum products. So we can see that we are talking about almost a half of the uh, consumption was natural gas. As years evolve and we progress, we see that uh, by the year 2015, we started to have much bigger consumption, 73 million tons per year, but I would say half and half. When we talk now, this year, we see that we are talking about more than 80 million tons per year of consumption, 50 of which is natural gas and the 30 is petroleum products. So now we have more uh, of natural gas rather than uh, normal petroleum products and this means that we have been able to use our gas uh, properly and introduce it to most of the uh, consuming uh, industries and consuming uh, disciplines. So more of household gas uh, connections rather than the LPG, uh, more of uh, power generation by natural gas rather than fuel oil and so forth. So we will able to reach this and when we, we see it, it represents in the pie, in the last pie, 65% of the consumption is natural gas now. So this is how we were able to increase more than three folds the natural gas consumption when you compare it like 22, 23 years ago. Same are the details of this pie and how it has grown and meanwhile growing the uh, gas consumption as we progress. Energy efficiency is also an important pillar uh, which not only in oil and gas, but actually in all sectors, in all industries. And uh, it is not, it's not only about introducing technologies, but it is also part of behavior and awareness. Uh, I think that this is uh, a good effort that we started and uh, we have in our sector now, in each of the companies, a department uh, under whether EGPC or under EGAS, a department in each company for energy efficiency. And we, are a we were able to have energy savings of about $130 million through applying different measures. Actually, we started this program like uh, five years ago, and uh, we had with us the EU giving some good technical support. I think that this is also an important pillar that we need to apply across the country and across, across all industries, not only uh, oil and gas. But since, as we said always, we are leading by example, and therefore we can, uh, we can, we can show the numbers and the savings that we have made over the last few years. The decarbonization, and this is part of our belief on how we can implement and we can walk the talk, that we started three years ago to, to, to create a department under EGAS for green energy and headed by vice chairman of EGAS. And we have endorsed the World Bank Initiative for zero routine flaring, as well as we have joined the Global Methane Pledge in the oil and gas. So we are now in, the, uh, uh, in different implementation stages, whether for flare gas or for the measurements of the methane in order to make sure where we will have 
the baseline and, and, and how we will be able to measure the savings and the reduction of the emissions. Uh, we started to identify the opportunities for implementing the, uh, the uh, CCC, CCUS, so carbon capture and utilization and storage, as well as supporting all the uh, regional uh, initiatives with this regard, especially now that we are uh, leading the East Mediterranean Gas Forum to have also a, uh, a role model in implementing the latest uh, in this regard. So when I was talking about the previous pillars, we were able here to capture and to measure how many projects did we do in different activities and what were the savings from the cost reduction of the uh, emissions. So the total was about 5.2 million tons per annum. And these are the emissions reduced when projects completed. So like for example now, we are proudly uh, able to say that we have now more than 14 million household connected already. So can you imagine that this, are, this is saving us 845,000 tons per annum. So this wouldn't have been unless we were able successfully to convert this household into natural gas rather than the LPG bottles. Same as for CNG. CNG is the compressed natural gas for vehicles, for cars. So now we have about half a million vehicles running on CNG saving and reducing 2.2 million tons per year of carbon. So this is some of the examples on how we could help in reducing emissions and carbon. And we, again, as oil and gas industry, could be responsible and could be responsive to the uh, climate change and the global warming. And we can add value and to improve the quality of our fuels, meanwhile, ensure security of supply through transition. Some of the uh, projects that we are uh, undergoing or under study, so either or, we have both in place. So these are some of the projects that we are uh, busy in uh, studying and some of them we are implementing. So we are talking, for example, about the biofuel from algae, some of the uh, biodegradable plastic uh, polylactic acid, as you know. So we have also uh, the melamine project, as well as bioethanol. And last is an important project that we are now undergoing uh, and will be uh, opened before year end, inshallah, the wooden plates production, the MDF project, that depends on feedstock coming from uh, rice straw. So these are some of the projects that are considered green projects. And uh, they can sum up to $2 billion uh, of value and would reduce 3.3 million tons per annum of CO2. Uh, when we talk about hydrogen, we had, as you know, a uh, lot of activities uh, for hydrogen and uh, green hydrogen. So uh, there is a national committee uh, headed by the prime minister, and we are uh, part of this uh, as ministry, together with the Ministry of Electricity and some other ministries. So we are uh, part of the national committee. However, uh, we are, as I was saying, developing our uh, strategy uh, for uh, low carbon hydrogen. Uh, when the coming few weeks will be announced, we have a joint declaration of intent signed with the German side, and for, at the side of the sidelines of the COP27, as we see the uh, lower photo, we have signed with the EU 
uh, an MOU regarding partnership in green hydrogen production and its derivatives. I think that what we are busy doing currently is preparing the uh, incentives package, and this is something that is really needed uh, for all investors. Uh, this part is missing, and we wanted to have a comprehensive package of incentives to promote uh, the production or the investments of, pro of projects for a green hydrogen, whether in the upside or upstream, which is the uh, production of uh, electricity through uh, renewables like uh, hi, like um, wind or solar, whether it is engaged in the uh, electrolysis or then derivatives like ammonia or uh, methanol. The way forward, as we were saying, we are talking about the decarbonization of our industry and uh, in order to make sure that we have sustainable energy with sustainable economy we need to all move together and i think that as we all recognize and the world now is all talking the same uh, with the same values same targets same intent about having gas as an agreed upon uh, clean transient fuel and we were able to align most and all of the oil and gas industry in order to be part of the solution. Therefore, their presence at COP27 was important. The access to finance, and this is something that we, we are all talking about it everywhere, uh, promoting uh, and helping uh, creating opportunities for financing, whether through uh, entrepreneurs, whether through uh, financing institutes, multilaterals, uh, all these kinds of funds will be needed, but they need to understand and to hear that the governments are supporting and they have issued the proper policies uh, for attracting investments together with the proper incentives at the beginning, because also incentives are not sustainable. You need to have an economic viable project. Um, as we do, we continue working with our partners, and this is uh, something that uh, has been already embedded now into our uh, operations. And like, if you remember a few years back, HSE was something that needed to be highly driven and pushed. And I'm not talking here about all companies, definitely. Some uh, larger scale companies with big multinational uh, uh, companies would lead for that. But I mean other, uh, whether regional or uh, independent or state, uh, were lacking uh, this culture and this implementation of uh, HSE to the level uh, of uh, embedded culture within the company and the staff. So it took us a journey of some years in order to make sure that we are all talking the same language. The same thing, um, we are now in this process of having uh, to decarbonize our industry by the same manner of raising awareness, pushing on uh, incentivizing those who are uh, going to collaborate in this regard, uh, opening new opportunities for newcomers, new companies, and new technologies, and to prove that there are savings. Because reducing uh, emissions from one side is good, but from the other side also is another good thing, which is saving uh, money by saving gas flared or methane flared or any kind of flares that would be useful that we would save for consumption or for exports and it will be win-win as we say. So uh, I think that uh, 
with the uh, different examples and uh, I would say engagements that we had over the last few months, uh, I think that we were able to to open an opportunity for new activities and new businesses to uh, to be part of our day-to-day uh, -day activities. We'd like to have more fuels with less emissions. We'd like to have clean fuels with no emissions. And I think that our industry will always be needed uh, for decades to come. But we need also to be more responsible and we need to be part of the community uh, and uh, therefore, as I was saying in my uh, opening remark, uh, the third event was the uh, Sarah Week in Houston. And why did I mention this? Because I wanted to say that the tone of uh, looking at oil and gas industry and oil and gas companies as not ideal and between brackets bad guys is not the same tone now. I mean globally there is a big recognition that this industry is needed for long and on the contrary there is more engagement and alignment between uh, renewable hydrogen, green, oil and gas, in order to make sure that if this engagement is proper and this alignment is proper, I think the transition will be faster. And this is why when we were asked why aren't we uh, accelerating sufficiently in renewable, if you remember, we were saying at some time technology of uh, storage, for example, uh, it needs more money, more investments, still fossil fuel is cheaper, and so forth. Now, when we engage oil and gas in this formula, it's going to be easier to include them, and this is part of how COP27 was successful, because it was inclusive, and therefore, solutions will be driven by oil and gas because this industry needs to stay for longer so they will create with technology all solutions in order to make sure that they are not harmful on the contrary they are needed and they are needed for also investing in transition so they will be working together uh, both industries in order to make sure the transition is met is clean and will be uh, driven earlier with that, I think that I took much longer, but anyway, uh, the questions and answers will, will be covering the rest of your thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, Mohammed Fouad, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, you have in front of you some uh, papers, if you'd like to, to ask questions for His Excellency. Please uh, give them to some of the BIBA team. Thank you. Before we start with our Q&A, just to give you a brief introduction from my perspective from Egypt Oil and Gas, that the energy sector in the past years finds itself at a historical turning point. Coming hard on the back of COVID-19 pandemic to, a, to, to major geopolitical conflicts as we all know. And the impact is felt by people across the globe. And at that point, and at the top of that list, is the impact of, of course, the energy security. Our Ministry of Petroleum and Mineral Resources, with the vision and the leadership of His Excellency, have been taking many measures and approaches to assure not only the stability of our sector in these hard times, but also the growth that can be achieved from it. And as I always state in my different uh, uh, interviews that we do that His Excellency and the Ministry of Petroleum in the past couple of years have created so much content, as we always say, Your Excellency, that shows the extraordinary progression of our sector being made, being made. 
Some of these approaches we will discuss today with His Excellency, which will include the continued efforts in attracting investments in our oil and gas sector, increasing both energy savings and efficiency, and the diversity of energy, energy supplies while still continuing to support the European Union supply needs, especially in these hard times. Good evening, Your Excellency. Good evening, Mohammed. Your Excellency, let me start with my first question. How is Egypt mitigating the impact of the energy trilemma, like access to energy, affordability, and reliability of supply? <laughs> this is a long question. It needs time to explain all the details, but anyway, I will, uh, I will try to be short. I think that uh, the most important thing that we had a strategy back in 2016, and therefore, uh, so far, alhamdulillah, our industry was resilient and was able to overcome uh, many challenges over the last few years, especially when we talk about COVID and now, with the war, you have seen prices increasing, you have seen the uh, supply chain problems, interruption of supplies. Uh, we, you know very well that we are a net importer of oil and products. Uh, however, thanks God that because we had had this strategy a few years back, so we are now a net exporters of natural gas. So on level of um, Egypt, uh, this is not sufficient. Therefore, part of the strategy that we were uh, aiming to, which is uh, our role as a regional gas hub, so therefore comes the second part, which trading gas. So we are importing gas from Israel, and then we are re-exporting gas, so therefore there is another kind of businesses that we are having. So uh, this is the second point. The third point is that, and perhaps quickly I had mentioned what we are doing regarding in energy efficiency. So we have also uh, some of our enablers are efficiencies that we are undergoing and we started four or five years ago showed some good savings as I presented. Also, with uh, the uh, digital transformation and the digitalization. So uh, now most of, uh, we have still one part missing, but most of the uh, organizations, whether state co companies uh, or organization or corporations like EGPC or other uh, holding companies like EGAS, together with their uh, relevant companies, uh, they have all went through uh, an intense, thorough program of uh, digitalization. And uh, we are now in the final stage of connecting all together, so uh, uh, laterally. So perhaps they are, or horizontally, so they are connected vertically, we are now getting into the phase to connect them uh, horizontally, and this perhaps will end by end of the month. Third thing is our operations, and uh, which is uh, the, uh, our refineries, so production of uh, refined products, and we've, we have gone through an in intense program of revamp, revamp or upgrades of our refineries, uh, across the geographies. So whether it is in Suez, whether it is in Greater Cairo or Alexandria or Asyut, so covering different uh, geographies, different markets, whereby we were able to close the gap between the refined products that we used to have and the refined products that we have now versus the domestic consumption. So reducing the, the amount of volumes of importation of crude and products, plus, as I said earlier, 
not only we are exporting natural gas, but we were able also to make use of natural gas by expanding the use of natural gas to household, so reducing the dependence on LPG bottles, which is a heavily subsidized, subsidized product, plus converting uh, many cars reaching about half a million and putting up uh, more stations for refueling. So using our resources, which is environmentally friendly, cheaper, uh, so avail it to our uh, consumers. Therefore, some reduction in the growth of consumption of gasoline. So these are all together have helped so far uh, to mitigate. Yet, challenge is still there. I do not say that we have uh, crossed it all. Big challenges that we are all aware of and uh, I hope, inshallah, with the dedication, with the good spirit, with uh, the hard work and uh, sincere teams that we do have, together with good partners that we have, I think we will be able to uh, manage and to continue the uh, journey uh, safely, inshallah. Inshallah, Your Excellency. I'm sure this is going to happen with with the efforts you're putting as a Ministry of Petroleum with all your partners. And as you always say, we are one family in this industry. So I'm sure this will definitely, these challenges will be overcome. Taking you from another approach, you continue to put lots of effort in attracting investments. And recently we just saw the launching of the new bid round for Brownfields, which is the first of its kind on the Egypt upstream gateway. And actually, perhaps you recall personally uh, you did have and you held one of your workshops uh, events uh, for brownfields and uh, we had several uh, roundtables regarding the brownfields and we have been talking about it so this had given me the comfort because I was testing the water I was seeing that there is a good appetite from companies to participate and to share their expertise and their knowledge for adding value on uh, depleted uh, reservoirs and all fields in operation for more than 20 or 30 or 40 years, some of them, and 50 years for some of them. So uh, having said so, we were able together with my colleagues at the ministry and at EGPC to have them some clusters, have them in clusters in order to, to make sure that we had the uh, proper structure in place when we uh, launched the uh, bid round, using also our uh, EUG platform, which is a digital platform, very well recognized. We took lead in that. Many countries now is following us for this digital platform. And uh, I think that it will be very much needed because now, as we were talking earlier in the first question, in order to close the gap, as I said, we are a net importer of oil and net importer of products. So our challenge is to increase production. So in addition to the traditional bid rounds for green fields uh, and the new blocks offered, we also are reviewing our old, uh, our old producing assets, which is the brownfields, and where we see that there are still good opportunities. As I said, testing the motor, and we uh, saw that there is a big interest. In addition to the technology that we have now uh, offered by our partners and service companies, uh, who are also very much interested, I think that it will uh, have some good, uh, it will yield, I hope, some good results. And we were able uh, lately during the Sarah week to have uh, this EUG uh, young team going there, promoting for the bid round and representing uh, our industry uh, properly with very skilled, uh, talented uh, young men and were able to uh, talk about these uh, brown fields over the last uh, over the last week, so uh, 
We are expecting uh, and we hope to receive some uh, good uh, bidders. And the idea is not how and who is giving me what. The idea is how to increase production. Uh, uh, we have been already approached several times several, over the last few years and over the last few months on, on different uh, uh, blocks or different brownfields existing assets. Uh, but um, the companies that were offering were talking about marginal, uh, marginal uh, additional uh, values. Uh, I'm talking here about production. Uh, so therefore, we saw that opening on, on, on a competition globally would, would be uh, a better. And as a, again, this is a kind of uh, uh, a kind of introducing a new category of companies, which I believe these are middle to small companies uh, and more of uh, service companies as well, which is uh, a category that our market and our uh, industry uh, is need as part of the mix that we have. We have large, super major uh, companies, we have independent, we have regional, and we have uh, medium companies. We need also to add to the uh, um, to the mix some different sizes and different uh, companies to be uh, and to join our industry. Thank you, Rexy. This is a, a very dynamic approach. So it's not only about the energy mix, it's also about the mix of different companies that can also participate in our industry. So good luck in your coming bid round, and I'm sure you, you're going to do a great job in that aspect. Your Excellency, Egypt has been on the spotlight from a global aspect in the past, maybe especially the past year, and being part of the solution when it comes to Europe's energy solution. Can you please update us on the recent updates with regards to, to this aspect and what are the regional cooperations going on and how is Egypt, Egypt uh, attracting more investments in natural gas and in LNG? This will be my last question before I ask you my personal question about Sierra Week and Egypt. Okay. So uh, I think that uh, we now whether uh, we know or we don't know or we are, whether we are sure or not, we are a regional gas player. So uh, it has become a fact. I mean, I don't need to, to tell you about it. Uh, we are not now in the trials, no. We are a regional gas player. Uh, and uh, proudly, we have created uh, an important international organization, which is the East Mediterranean Gas Forum, headquartered in Cairo and having members, uh, good, important, different countries, whether uh, founding members or uh, observer members, or I mean, and European, Arab, African, Israelis, Americans, Europeans, I mean, just name it. This means that uh, Cairo or Egypt organization for gas is recognized. So this is number one. Number two, having said that, uh, we are now, and, and this was back again, a strategy uh, uh, that we issued in 2016, paving the way for the creation of the uh, forum. Then comes the war then everybody were, were looking to us. So they were saying, okay, can you give us some gas? Of course, as I said in my speech, I do not say that we are a big exporter of gas or a big producer of gas, but at least we are helping and we are giving some extra gas that we have but with regional cooperation, we are now having access to additional gas from Israel. Potentially, we'll be having soon uh, from uh, Cyprus. I think that having made these uh, arrangements and uh, signing these uh, agreements 
has opened the opportunities for several things. Perhaps now you've heard and you know that uh, we have made an important uh, uh, progress regarding the gas in Gaza, offshore Gaza. So now the Palestinians will have uh, some gas as well. And this is an Egyptian consortium, private sector, but led by eGaz, together with Palestinians. So we will be developing, inshallah, this opportunity. You've heard lately the delineation, the demarcation of the uh, water uh, economic zones with Israel and Lebanon. This will open another uh, opportunity, hopefully. With the latest discoveries that you hear every day in Cyprus, in Egypt, in Israel, I think all this are answering the question on where would this gas go? So what we are currently doing, proving over the last few years that we are in good collaboration with all countries, with neighboring countries, with overseas countries, with super power countries, we are friends to everybody. Uh, we are using natural gas for welfare, well-being of our people and the regional people, and as well as a catalyst for peace, for good things. This is number one. Number two, the opportunity for these gases to be developed, when you think about it, where should it go? So the first question, the first answer would be, short term, medium term, it's Egypt. I mean, with no brainer. So you, you don't need to uh, rethink twice. It has to come to Egypt. Not because we are the best opportunity, no, yeah, we are the best opportunity now, yes. Each country and each company has the right then to weigh their options. Go right, go left, go north, go south, that's fine. But for now, if you want your gas to be developed and monetized, go to Egypt. Having said that, we are then, we have and we are and we will be always prepared for this to happen, whether on political level, uh, economic level, uh, all levels that you just would need for this to happen. So we are very optimistic, inshallah. We have good uh, teams, we have good partners, we have good uh, diplomatic and economic uh, relationships with all neighboring countries and with all uh, powers as we were talking earlier. So I think we have a very balanced uh, opportunity and uh, portfolio where uh, this is going to create opportunities for businessmen, business companies, and people and employees and staff and industries. I mean, just name it. And then we will say we have too much content, really. So, and this will create opportunities for upstreams, upstream players, midstream, when you talk about LNG, when we talk about downstream. And if you look at the map now, and you see the blocks in Egypt, east side, west side, you see Cyprus, the blocks, you see Israel, the blocks, you see the Red, the Red Sea, the blocks, I mean, I mean the offshore blocks offered and awarded, whether in any of the countries, you will see all brands of all companies are there. From the Arab Gulf till the USA, till the UK, France, Italy, just name any brand who is not there with us. This means that there are synergies and these companies believe in investing in Egypt and into the neighboring countries, even if we don't have here, but they can find it there or there. So at any, but where should they put their investments? 
يا دينو ده الدارود ويل اول ذا رودز ويل اول ليد تو ايجيبت ان شاء الله سو ذير فور جود كولابوريشن از اي سيد ويز مور ويز مور هارد ورك تو بي دان ان ذا كامينج فيو مانس اي ثينك وي كان كلوز لوت اوف of many deals that are uh, on the table now. So we are currently talking with many, 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 many people, upstreamers, downstreamers, midstreamers, countries, governments, just name it. And things are progressing, inshallah. So perhaps it's an in-depth answer, but it is very important because people need to be aware of what we are doing in those days and to be optimistic. But with some patience, inshallah. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And actually, as you were talking right now, I'm, I'm keep on evaluating all the collaboration and efforts being done. And ladies and gentlemen, as you might all know, my job is mainly to provide the daily updates of what's going on in this industry. And during your visit, during Syria week, the only question, before I ask you my personal question, but the question that always came to my mind when I open my website every day in the morning, I see the amount of engagements that you, you did during Syria week. Did you get some sleep during Syria week? I'm really actually, uh, when I arrived there, I was suffering from the jet lag and I'm still suffering now when we came back. So I didn't have any, I'm, it's very difficult, you are right. But actually the idea is when I was telling you now and explaining the, uh, why you are saying the engagements because it was very important because it happens to be one of the biggest energy forums or conferences or meetings in the world. So therefore, it was important because we had to have some important meetings there. So all the CEOs of the companies that I mentioned, our partners, we needed to align ourselves because as I was saying now, we are taking decisions, decisions for the country, decisions for the future of energy in the region. So, and alhamdulillah, I'm not exaggerating. The center of this is Egypt because we have the infrastructure, we have the talents, we have the skills, we have the manufacturing and fabrication capabilities. We have all the tools to take us for uh, the future, the near future that is waiting, inshallah. So therefore, we need to be uh, at the level of the expectation of our partners and of the governments of uh, the other countries where we are uh, potentially uh, having deals with and we need to have the same tone and the same uh, synergies that we are looking for. So therefore, uh, it was full of engagements and Meanwhile, as I was saying when I was at the podium, that now the other side of the story, which is how the tone now against oil and gas has come down. And now there is more uh, acceptance and more, uh, uh, more realistic uh, uh, approach saying, yeah, okay, but please, just decarbonize. He said, why didn't you listen to us from the beginning? This is what we were saying. But you didn't give us the chance. So now, this is how we are, uh, how the world now is talking. And, and to tell you the truth, it is, not, it is not the company's mistake. It is politicians. So this is how politics could sometimes uh, not maneuver, no, actually mislead for some time, wasting some valuable time in a direction and then comes to senses. And I'm not saying that from my mind. I think that with the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, I think it has unveiled the reality that the world is not ready today for renewable. Because when gas shortages happened, okay, switch off, okay, is renewable ready to take over? They were not ready. So this gap showed that you need to diversify. You need another source of supply for some time. That's fine. 
But until such time, we need to agree together that we need to be responsible and with less emissions, as we said. So we said, okay, we are welcome, but please consider us with you. Hence, politicians started to change the tone and to get more engaged with uh, our industry, and this is how it comes. And you will see more of money put in research and development through oil and gas companies, because oil and gas companies do spend a lot in R&D, and they will then prove that they can also diversify in their files, in their portfolios, I mean, and they will develop clean energies as well. So uh, this was an important take home from uh, the Sierra Week and how the world now is looking at our industry as oil and gas. Takes me to my last question. You talked a lot about COP27 during the, your presentation with de on decarbonization, but we did not talk much about the Egypt Petroleum Show because what we've realized, or I personally also too realized, that Egypt Petroleum Show, which is, congratulations, I think starting from next year, it's called the Egypt Energy Show, uh, that there's a huge progress within this event and the participation from the international level shows how this event is becoming a very important event, not just for Egypt, maybe for the whole region right now, East Mediterranean, uh, North Africa and Africa. Congratulations on that, but I would like you to elaborate with all the officials that have participated from different industries, um, executives and government officials. How do you see the Egypt energy show? I will see it more inclusive, and this is how uh, the world is evolving now, and this is the reality. When we were talking about COP27 and how we needed to, I mean, who requested this decarbonization day? We requested this decarbonization day, and we fought for it. Why is that? Because we saw that it is time now to be seen and to be part of the solution. Having said so, so there is now a new word used is decarbonization. So it is becoming now a word in the vocabulary that will be used frequently. So this means that there is someone who need to accommodate this word. To accommodate this word, that means that it has to come under some sponsor to endorse it. So therefore, it is our industry. So therefore, when we said uh, our uh, Egypt oil and gas uh, show next year will be inclusive, so we have a decarbonization industry coming. We will have a lot of companies that, a lot of technology suppliers, a lot of vendors, a lot of uh, uh, institutes, lot of, you will see a lot of things in this specific world. Plus, when you talk, and the world now is talking about hydrogen, so we need to include hydrogen somewhere. So, as I said, not necessarily, that's why we call it low carbon hydrogen. So, you will see also this, uh, because it is hand to hand with our oil and gas companies. They have all added into their uh, discipline, this uh, technology, whether uh, green or uh, low carbon or whatever. Plus, uh, we need to talk about uh, transition and how you will transition and for how long and how you will improve this uh, through capacity building and through innovative ideas. So therefore, this year, uh, a decision on having, inshallah, next year our show with a little modification becoming an energy show uh, doesn't mean except that we are evolving, that we are talking the same language that the world is talking. We are not an old fashioned. So we keep on updating ourselves in order to still be attractive, to still attract more investors, to still attract. Uh, more exhibitors and speakers and so forth. So uh, you need to be always uh, uh, aware and always uh, 
uh, new in order to make sure that you are always successful. And uh, uh, always we say, success brings success. Najah bigib najah. مش كده ولا إيه؟ ف we have to continue on creating new ideas and new opportunities to maintain a leading role and a role model in Egypt. إن شاء الله. شكرا محمد. إن شاء الله يا إكسنسيين. Actually, yeah, just to comment on exactly that the industry is revolving in in all different angles. Now we also we see the word sustainability. It's not only in our sector, but it, it, it is included right now in all different parts of uh, the different sectors. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for your time. Thank you so much for always for your valuable information you share with us. Please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in, uh, and, and to thank His Excellency. Thank you so much.